This is George Zeller of Cleveland. Listen to the International Radio Report every Sunday morning at 10.30 on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. Welcome, everyone, to the International Radio Report. It is Sunday, March the 3rd, 2024, here in the city of Montreal. My name's Sheldon, here with Jill. We thank you for tuning in to our program. We're here every week with 30 minutes of news and information from the world of radio. You can reach us by email, radioreport at yahoo.com. Our show is live streaming and archived at ckut.ca. That is the website of CKUT Radio here in Montreal. Our Facebook group, International Radio Report, we have a member, a new member this week from Norway. His name is Torlik, and uh, we thank him for uh, for tuning into the program and joining the Facebook group from Norway. We have 957 members. We invite you to go and join the group as well. You can find us on Facebook, International Radio Report. Our YouTube channel, we had a little bump up of uh, subscribers this week. We're up to 955. You can find us on YouTube if you search for International Radio Report or simply at IRR will get you to us. And our X account I uh, is at IRRCKUT, where you can follow us on X. So there you have it, uh, ways to get in touch and listen to our program. We thank you for tuning in. And uh, we start off with some local news from our own station here, CKUT in Montreal. Our funding drive, our annual funding drive is coming up, and it is just around the corner. Uh, so the station wanted us to get everybody in uh, on it and uh, get it on the radar to try to get you excited about it, planning to contribute, which we hope you will, to support the radio station and support programming like this. The funding drive uh, dates, it starts on Friday, March the 15th, so not that far away, and runs through Sunday, March the 24th. Uh, we have a theme for this year. It is Montreal Sounds Like CKUT. And included with it is a CKUT-centric map designed by a local artist, Amory Sandford. So you can check that out. And the goal this year, $50,000 is what we're looking to raise. Last year was 45000 and it was surpassed, uh, reached almost 55000 by May last year. So the station uh, coordinator for the funding drive is saying that uh, let's shoot for our pre-pandemic goal of $50,000 this time around. We will uh, call on your support, as we always do. So uh, we'll have two shows during the funding drive, and uh, we'll be giving you all the information about that as it approaches. There's always a lot of prizes being offered for donations. We'll give you all of those details once we have them. You can check out the website as well. Information will be posted up on ckut.ca. Remember, nowhere else will you hear a show like the International Radio Report. We start the show with a breaking news, uh, something very surprising here in Quebec. Paul Hood, that we talked about a few times here on the show, was on different radio stations, at different shows, uh, passed away at age 69, basically started his career, a radio career, at CKAC 730. And he was very popular. So a um, man named Pierre Robert looked and said, you know, you're talented. Maybe you should uh, pass an audition. And finally got a night shift show uh, starting May 4th, 1975. Ten weeks later, he was at the morning show. So he was also at CKMF 94.3, CFGL, uh, was also at uh, 98.5 from time to time. We talked about him a few months back because he wanted to be part of a, a sports show. And he kind of tried it and finally said that it's something that he was not ready for. It's the type of radio that he wasn't actually uh, comfortable with. So um, he took some time off. He was also on TV and some um, actually uh, acting career in some movies too. He was waiting for the solar eclipse of April 8th, had a passion for space and astronomy. So uh, unfortunately, uh, surprised a lot of people, I think, this weekend uh, to see that he passed away at age 69, a uh, very popular radio host in the Francophone radio 
in Quebec. So we have a news item about 100 years of CBC Radio in Ottawa. Uh, February 27, 1924. The uh, station hit the airwaves. This is via the uh, Historical Society of Ottawa. 100 years ago, on February 27, 1924, the radio station we know today as CBC Radio 1 Ottawa went on the air for the first time. In its days before evolving into CBC Radio, Canada's national radio network was operated by the government-owned CNR, the Canadian National Railway and Ottawa was the proud home to its flagship station. The new Ottawa station's innovations included regular road conditions report and its daily time signal from the experimental Farms Dominion Observatory. The station was the first to send out a live broadcast of a Stanley Cup playoff game, a 1924 match between the defending champions, Ottawa Senators, and the Montreal Canadiens. The brand new station's signal was so powerful, its broadcast could be heard as far away as California and Panama. In 1929, the station moved its facilities into Ottawa's Chateau Laurier Hotel, the CBC, then known as the CRBC, or the Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission, took over its operations in 1933. In 1937, the CBC renamed the station CBO. Historical Society of Ottawa member James Powell shares the story of Ottawa's pioneering CKCH, later CNRO, radio, the most powerful station in Canada, when it opened on February 27, 1924. The predecessor of today's CBC on the Today in Ottawa History blog. And we'll post the link to this, and it's uh, nice to see 100 years. That must have been something pretty incredible to listen to. And imagine how clear the airwaves must have been in 1924 compared to today and the station being heard so far as Panama. Yeah, they uh, they don't say what frequency the station was on in this particular report. There might be something in that uh, further report on the blog that we'll post up. I, I was trying to remember their CBO is not on AM any longer uh, that's the other thing we didn't mention of course there was no fm at that time these nope. these these were am radio stations but cbo was there for a very very long time in ottawa they were official call letters for the station uh, we had stations here in montreal afterwards that had uh, the cbc uh, designated call signs for them uh, cbm and cbf were the two clear channels at the english and the french in montreal and Pretty much all the major cities across the country had these uh, pioneering stations come on the air. And they they were mostly 50,000 watts, and they did cover, like this one did, quite wide expanses of territory. So, uh, as you said, the band was fairly open those days, not as much interference as we have today. Uh, Sad that most of those AM stations have been converted, though, over to FM these days. There are still some of them, particularly out on the prairies, where uh, some of the the big CBC stations uh, for Radio 1 uh, remain on AM, but uh, now we find most of them over on FM. But uh, yeah, 100 years, it was worth talking about. And uh, if you go to the blog uh, link that we'll put up, uh, there's a lot more information there on the station uh, as well. So you can check that out. You can almost ask yourself, in 1924, how many people actually had a radio that could listen to this? Yeah, exactly. It it was. Uh, it must have been pretty exciting, you know, yep. that the, the notice come out that here's this radio station starting, and you know, tune turn whatever radio on that you have to take a listen to it. So uh, yeah, uh, good a good nice piece of history. I was glad that the uh, historical society recognized that 100 years of uh, CBC Radio in Ottawa. So what's happening with our sun? Well, the sun is fairly active. There's a lot of sunspots. There's particularly one that is still very active, AR3595, that I actually used my solar glasses to look at. And yes, we could see it just with the unaided eyes. It was just crazy big sunspot here and very active, sending a lot of flares. But, you know, all of those flares had pretty much no impact, no geomagnetic storms really, uh, the few impacts that we had were weak, so conditions were really good. Actually, I had what I think is the strongest ever signal I've ever had from Radio Thailand 
13750 this week. It was like a local station. It was so powerful. It was amazing. March, of course, is now the month of the year. Well, one of the months of the year uh, where the uh, it's time for auroras. Uh, so March and April, uh, and of course, September, October, uh, is the time when it doesn't take much from the sun to actually generate any geomagnetic storms. So this uh, is going to be an interesting month to look at, especially if conditions uh, become uh, more active with flaring. Uh, there's a sunspot that is really big that's supposed to appear this week. It will rotate into view, so this could uh, you know, change what propagation is all about uh, during the, uh, the weekend shortwave. Uh, sunspot number 107, solar flux 164. And there's no really large or any coronal holes to mess up things. So enjoy the propagation when it's there. And we'll see what happens this week if uh, any new sunspot starts flaring. The best way to really witness all of this, well, you got to turn on a radio and listen. For the latest news from the world of radio every Sunday morning at 1030 on the International Radio Report on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal and online at CKUT.ca. Some of you, particularly in the United States, uh, may have suffered a bit of disruption with your cell phones last week. Quite a disruption for a lot of uh, people. It was pretty chaotic. Well, there's a radio link uh, story that popped out as a result of that, and it comes from Radio Inc. Former FEMA Administer Gaynor says, where cell signals fail, AM is there. A former acting secretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security, Pete Gaynor, is the latest official to speak out in favor of the AM for Every Vehicle Act, referencing growing nuclear danger overseas, as well as recent domestic technological troubles. The past administrator of the FEMA, or Federal Emergency Management Agency, published an op-ed in the Hill publication discussing how the nationwide cellular blackout on February the 22nd underscored the vital importance of retaining AM as the cornerstone of the United States emergency infrastructure. The incident, which left millions of Americans without cell service, led to first responders voicing concerns about the potential dangers posed by the lack of cell reception, particularly the inability of the public to reach emergency services. Gaynor said that the vulnerability of cell towers and internet signals, especially during disasters, to both natural and man-made threats, including potential foreign cyber attacks, was starkly illuminated. Despite opposition from the auto industry, Gaynor said the pressing need to maintain a reliable emergency communication system is evident, especially in light of the potential threats to U.S. communications infrastructure, such as cyber attacks and a reported development of space-based nuclear weapons by the Russian government and military. Gaynor wrote, some automakers have begun to compromise America's public warning system by removing AM radios from their car dashes. This is problematic because AM radio is the foundation of both the NPWS and the EAS systems. While other communications platforms like cell and internet are important to public safety, they have neither the reach nor the resiliency of AM. America's emergency alert system is heavily reliant on primary entry points, the majority of which are on AM with direct connections to FEMA and the National Weather Service. The bipartisan AM for Every Vehicle Act would require all auto manufacturers to keep AM radio access in all vehicles made or sold in the United States. And as we added last week, as well, the FM radios that may start yeah. disappearing from cars as well. So uh, this is another addition to the support for keeping AM radio uh, inside cars. And not just inside cars, but AM stations, we keep losing AM stations. Uh, there's a need for them to be there. And, uh, you know, we got, a, we got a little taste of what can happen with the cell system going down. One of the biggest problems that I think we're facing is that more and more we are relying on only one way of communicating with each other. And the problem is, when there's only one way of communicating with each other, if that way fails, we 
just don't know what to do anymore. And, you know, radio needs to stay uh, both AM and FM for that particular reason. We had one big outage here last year, the Rogers here in Canada had the similar type of, uh, of, of outage. Every time it's always also, you know, like AT&T this week, I talked about it on my uh, tech channel. A weird, you know, answer to why everything failed. And it's always, you know, well, somebody put this wrong code here. And it's like, yeah, but it made all of the United States or all of Canada without cell coverage suddenly. Uh, it, it's crazy. We need to have several ways of communicating, several ways of getting our news. Uh, we got to stop thinking that AM, FM radio and radio in general is 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 an old technology. It has its importance, particularly in times like the AT&T outage. I mean, radio was there to give you some news and maybe give you some news of when that cell service is going to come back. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, and, you know, I think with the younger generation that is growing up with only using these newer devices and depending on those devices, they haven't, in many cases, been exposed to the alternatives when those systems don't work. So that's going to be an ongoing problem as well. If you take the radios away, then they're never going to learn about them. Mm. At least if the radio is there, maybe they might, you know, it, curious, <laughs> just play with it a bit. Maybe like, oh, the phone's not working, but let's turn this thing on and see if something's happening there. I, I think we're in a, in a, in a time where we're at a, a, a dangerous point where some of the reliable older technologies that still work are being forgotten about or not even known about by some people. You know, most people don't know that their cell phone is actually a radio. Mm. Um, it doesn't have a wire attached to it. It has a built-in antenna. It connects with antennas that are up on tops of buildings and what have you. But if the system that operates that uh, device is not working, it doesn't matter that you've got a radio no. in your hand. That type of radio is not going to work based on the technology that it uses. We just talked about a 100-year-old technology of the radio station starting up in Ottawa. Um, the stations that run today run exactly the same way those stations ran 100 years ago and even longer than that. So with all the new technologies that have changed, so many of those new technologies are based on that old radio technology. Yep, definitely. So in our next story, we have uh, how radio is making women's voices heard in Afghanistan. And this is via BBC Media Action. Women's lives have changed dramatically since the Taliban returned to power in 2021. They are now largely unable to travel freely on their own, to work in most jobs, to go to parks, salons, or gyms, or to pursue higher education. But women are still allowed to work in the media and in healthcare, albeit with restrictions, and media now plays an even more important role in the lives of women in the country who rely on radio, television, and social media for information, entertainment, and connection. The Women's Voice radio show is led by Women for Women at Radio TV Obor in the remote and conservative province of Bagis in the country's far northwest. We have been conducting lifeline training with radio stations across Afghanistan, supporting them to reach their audiences with critical information on health, nutrition, and other issues as the humanitarian crisis deepens. In Bagis, we are supporting these journalists to create programs about real-life health problems and challenges that women experience in this remote region, ensuring women can access information about health issues from wherever they are. In a time when it can be hard for them to travel freely, women at home can also call in to discuss their concerns with experts. Nasira says the two-day lifeline program training she received was very useful as women in this conservative region have little access to health information and services. In the past, she said, the station's programs were focused on stories of people's lives and situations rather than useful information. Nadia explains the topics they discuss are not provocative. They focus on pregnancy, 
mental health, and other health issues, making sure to discuss each topic from all angles, including a Sharia point of view. Despite taking steps to ensure they are within current directives, Nasira and Nadia's work remains very challenging, particularly in this conservative province. Late last year, BBC Media Action conducted a media survey on Afghanistan to find out how people are accessing media and contents since the Taliban returned to power. We found that women have been particularly hard hit by changes to media, both has contributors and has audiences. Our researchers also learned that media has become a lifeline as their main source of news and information because the increased limitations on their movement at work and in education. The Women's Voice radio show is broadcast by Radio TV Obor, one of several women-led and women-focused stations still active in Afghanistan. BBC Media Action has been working on Radio TV Obor and others on lifeline training and building journalistic skills through a project funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. You know, this is great, and it's a great way to reach also an audience that is very fragile right now in Afghanistan because, you know, they're, they, they sometimes need to hide, sometimes cannot even ask for any information or any health uh, information they would need. And this is nice because, you know, radio waves, they go to these places where you're a little and probably invisible. You don't need to reach out. You'll hear information. And you have these people giving out all of this uh, useful and very vital information to them. And they can hear it and they can use that information for their own you know, purpose. And that's a great, great way to help out. Yeah, it's giving some of them an opportunity to communicate with these stations as well, to yeah. ask questions uh, you know, that they probably couldn't have done before. The only concern I have about this is if you know, we keep talking about clampdowns that are going on you know, from week to week and month to month. It is kind of surprising that they're allowing this type of programming and, and radio station to operate at this point in time. Uh, will it continue? That's going to be the big question, I think. Yeah. Uh, if they become more severe in their, in their uh, policing of what goes on in the country, some of these services might be at risk, I think. Yeah, definitely. And let's hope that uh, it can continue. We have one uh, late breaking story, which we'd like to tell you about. Uh, this name might be familiar to some of you uh, in the radio community, in the um, audio sound equipment community, and in amateur radio as well. Uh, the gentleman's name is Bob, Bob Heil, and um, he was sound engineer icon, and he has passed away. The audio industry mourns the loss of Bob Heil, a pioneering American audio engineer known for his revolutionary contributions. Bob Heil fought a courageous year-long battle with cancer and peacefully passed away on March the 1st at the age of 89, surrounded by his loving family. His remarkable impact on professional and live sound engineering, as well as his influence in the amateur radio community, has left an enduring mark on the world. Throughout his illustrious career, Bob Heil's innovative work and unwavering dedication have significantly shaped the audio engineering landscape. His groundbreaking contributions will be remembered as a testament to his passion and commitment to the industry. Bob Heil's legacy extends far beyond his technical accomplishments. He leaves behind a profound impact on those who had the privilege of knowing and working with him. As we mourn the loss of this influential figure, we honor the indelible mark he has left on the audio engineering world and the lives of those he touched. And certainly in the amateur radio community, um, I know many people that were using the Heil headphone sets with their amateur radio equipment. So um, he was, uh, you know, very innovative in, in coming up with new designs and new technologies for sound engineering. Uh, much of it that was corp incorporated into things that we use in, in our radio activities as well. So uh, we thought we would uh, mention his passing on today's show. So we have upcoming ham radio contests. Starting off uh, next weekend with an event organized by the Radio Society of Great Britain. It is the uh, Commonwealth Contest. 
running from uh, 1000 Zulu, March the 9th to 1000 Zulu, March the 10th, 80 through 10 meters, and it is a CW event. There's the Straight Key Century Club Weekend Sprintathon, 1200 Zulu, March 9th to 2359 Zulu, March the 10th, and it's 160 through 6 meters, and it's CW. Next, organized by the Union Radio Aficionados Español, is uh, running the EA PSK 63 contest, a 1200 Zulu March 9th to 1200 Zulu March 10th, uh, 10 through 80 meters, and the mode is BPSK 63. There's the AGCW QRP contest, 1400 Zulu to 2000 Zulu March 9th, organized by the German Telegraphy Activity Group. It's 80 through 10 meters, Mode is CW, but it's QRP, low power only. We have some QSO parties coming up. The Oklahoma QSO party, 1500 Zulu March 9th to 2100 Zulu March the 10th. That's organized by Connie, K5 Charlie Mike. 80 meters through 6 meters, and it's really all modes except no FT8. So CW, SSB, PSK, and RTTY. There's the Idaho QSO party, 1900 Zulu, March 9th to 1900 Zulu, March 10th, organized by the Pocatello Amateur Radio Club. Bands 160 through 10 meters. It's also CWSSB in digital, but no FT8. And finally, the National Contest Journal has organized the North American Sprint RTTY from 0 0.00 to 0 0.359 Zulu, March the 10th. And that is 80, 40, and 20 meters only. And the mode is radio teletype. And we are out of time. Uh, we should mention uh, one important note before we wrap things up today, and that is the time change to Eastern Daylight Time. That will be happening next weekend, Saturday night into Sunday morning. So that means that our International Radio Report show will still air at 10.30 Eastern Time, but if you're checking on UTC, it will now be at 14.30 UTC rather than 15.30 UTC. So please take note of that. Uh, we hope that the CKUT system will accommodate that. Uh, we've had some issues with that in the past. So if you miss the show for some reason, if things get uh, out of alignment at uh, CKUT, we will have it for you, of course, on the, uh, on the archives at CKUT and on our YouTube channel for you. So that will do it for this week. We thank you for tuning in. We will be back again next week, 10.30 Eastern, 14.30 UTC. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.